<laughs> well, you're uh, Adele. You're a terrific writer. Uh, I read your article in uh, Advent about darkness and quoted you. And I'm delighted to have some uh, FaceTime with you uh, as we enter into Black History Month. Um, so thanks for being with us. Uh, I have three, three questions, three and a half questions. The first one is, uh, what is the importance of Black History Month to you personally? Sure. Well, I think Black History Month provides a particular opportunity to focus specifically on the stories, histories, lives, and experiences of Black people in Canada and around the world. Now, of course, this can be a conversation and a focus at any point throughout the year. Um, and in fact, I would encourage that strongly <laughs> to continue to engage in these conversations throughout the year. But February offers a particular focal point to really engage in these conversations in a, a deeper and focused way. To me, it's also a chance to focus on conversations around anti-Black racism and um, to really delve into um, what are some of the systemic issues, the systemic uh, racism, systemic injustices related to anti-Black racism that we really need to wrestle with, both as church and society. Great. So, so it's really setting aside time specifically to pay attention. And I guess the hope is for churches and uh, other faith communities to spend the entire year. So we know there's a, an intention in this particular month that's really important. Um, and I, when I think about that, uh, I was asked a question by a person of color in our community to ask I, uh, me to ask you, what is, uh, you know, why, why would this person feel it's an okay thing to go to a United Church? You know, just the reality is we're predominantly white. So w as a person of color, what's that about? Or how might you respond to her question? So why would a person of color want to come to a United, a United Church? Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, a few things. One, I think the United Church is is working hard <laughs> around questions of, of anti-racism. And I, I, I just want to distinguish what we mean when we say the, the United Church. So when we say the United Church of Canada, I think we're talking about all of us, um, all of our communities of faith, all of our regions, um, the, the, the church as a whole. Um, so maybe we're talking about specific communities. Why would someone want to come to a specific United Church congregation? Um, let's look broadly. So nationally, the decision-making body of the church has made some commitments, some policy decisions that I think would affect local communities. So one is this recent commitment to becoming an anti-racist denomination. It's not saying that we are there, not at all. It's saying this is a commitment to a journey to continued work to focus on dismantling systemic racism throughout the church in all of its forms. And there's a role for local congregations in that. So as congregations who are part of the United Church, the hope is that everyone would um, be engaged in some way around thinking about, well, how do we dismantle systemic racism? So a person of color may be interested in being a part of a congregation that's actively working in that area. Again, lots of policy work that's been done um, since 2000 and the year 2000 and beyond around um, what we hope to become, um, naming some goals, aspirations. But again, it takes all of us and all of our work and all of our communities to really work at this together uh, to um, delve into what we to delve into what we hope to become, which is an anti-racist domination. Yeah, and as I think about that myself, um, you know, I think about. It's the how do I enter into conversations as a as a learner, as a listener? Uh, one of the things that came out of Black Lives Matter movement more recently since last June or, or May or June uh, is really the the call and the time to, to do some listening. Um, is that what you would say that for it's an opportunity to share each other's stories like policy is going to be one very important element but listening to each other's stories and I mean really listening is probably the first step in my mind is that is that so I think I think it can be if it's done really carefully um, I think at times people who are black indigenous people of color are asked to tell their stories and if it's a painful story of racial trauma it can be re-traumatizing to keep being the one being the storyteller so there is, there are times for telling and sharing stories, absolutely. At the same time, I would strongly advocate that somewhere along the way, um, that the people who are white also need to do some of their own learning. Learning and unlearning. Um, stories are one element of that indeed, but um, reading, education, 
figuring out what, what is this thing called white supremacy? What does it look like? How does it manifest itself in church and society? Some of that's work that people can do on their own um, without necessarily um, always having a storytelling element. That's good. That's really helpful because I think Indigenous people have also shared the same kind of, uh, we're tired of, of this, <laughs> telling our stories, because again, it's opening a wound. So there's a combination of us doing our own reading, our own um, discovery, as well as sharing uh, in conversation and understanding through story. Mm -hmm. um, when you think of the United Church of Canada and your work across the country, um, What's, what's a highlight you're seeing in this? Uh, uh, for our church, Hillhurst United Church, we have a, a BIPOC uh, committee that's working with us, um, Black, Indigenous, and people of color, for those who are listening, uh, to look at uh, education with our board, uh, to encourage us uh, to have representation uh, and, and to work both within the church and in the, in the city uh, around these issues. What are you seeing across the country in the United Church of Canada right now? In terms of what people are doing in their own yeah. communities, yeah, uh, definitely people are doing education. Um, uh, so people are are engaging in study groups. People are doing book studies. Uh, people are preaching, teaching, um, trying to figure out um, how do we think about anti-racism uh, in our own local communities of faith. Um, I think there have been conversations in this community around what it means to be public, intentional, and explicit. Uh, on a variety of topics, including anti-racism. And that's great. Uh, that's happening in other places too. So um, education is happening. Um, people are, are thinking about theology differently. So how do we um, think about uh, racial justice as it relates to theology, how we read and understand scripture, the language we use, um, that's happening too. Um, the other thing I would say, um, it, you know, just from a from a national perspective, um, a few of us are working on developing a national anti-racism action plan, uh, which will be an exciting way of, of delving in and engaging um, uh, throughout the church. We'd name some here, some key um, directions that we might think about for the next couple of years um, and offer some opportunities for people to um, delve into those. So that's uh, in the development stage right now. It's coming. Um, so there's different ways that people are are involved in engaging engaging the work. Uh, and I just I I do want to loop back to policy because I know that it's it's it can be dry. It's not it's not the be all and end all, not at all. But I I still do think that there can be a role for policy. Sometimes it it names um, this is uh, a direction that we want to become, what we want to do, and then it helps us work towards it. So I know um, there are different um, people across the church who are in their own local context thinking about policy thinking about changing policy or even reviewing their own and their own policy through um, an anti-racist lens. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. When you, you know, a moment ago, you mentioned uh, how it's changing our theology, looking at scripture. When you think of what scripture comes to mind, that's an important piece of this work that you return to often or think about as you think about scripture. Yeah, one of the one of my favorites is uh, the Canaanite or the Syrophoenician woman. Her story appears in Matthew and in Mark. Um, and this, just briefly, it's the story of a woman who um, approaches Jesus, and uh, Jesus calls her what is essentially a racial slur, and uh, she kind of pushes back at him. And at the end of the story, Jesus says, "Well, you know, you're, um, Jesus responds in a more positive way in the end." What I love about this story is that um, there's so much going on. <laughs> there's power dynamics at play. Jesus as, uh, you know, it reflects the humanness of Jesus as someone who's shaped by his own cultural context um, and who, who responds in a way that makes um, sense culturally, but is still, uh, it's still a slur. Um, but the woman who, who was marginalized in multiple ways because of her identities felt strong enough to push back and name um, this this is what I'm seeking. This is um, justice for me. This is what it means. Um, and the person who held power was changed in that situation. So for me, there's just so much richness in the story in terms of how we're shaped by our cultural context. Sometimes we don't even understand it. Um, the, the challenge of racial slurs and what that, um, how that impacts people, the, the power of the individual to push back and um, yeah. the ways in which um, people can be changed in the process. So I think there's a lot in there that can be delve, um, delved into. And for me, it's just a, always a powerful story of inspiration. Yeah, so that's why. Well, she teaches him. She absolutely right? teaches him. She that's what I love him. 
That's what I and, love in that story. And it re- and it reminds us. I mean, she was so marginal. She she has multiple identities that marginal, right? Her her own cultural identity, her gender identity, her um, racial background. All of these made her really an outsider. Um, and yet she she was a teacher. <laughs> She's the one who made a change. She made Jesus change his mind. And uh, I think that's powerful. I love that. I mean, one of the things I love about Jesus is he apparently asks 186 questions, but he only answers three. <laughs> so the whole question and answer, the conversation between them is lovely. Yeah. And, and there's a humility in Jesus to, mm. to learn from her, which is beautiful. Okay, last question. Um, when, you, when you close your eyes and you imagine God, what does God look like for you? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, you know, I've, I've often said it, it's so difficult to capture God with, I th- think we're all limited in our cultural understandings. Um, you know, I, I remember reading it, lots of great theology books, you know, James goes, God is black. Um, and yet I'm not, I'm not sure that I would limit, um, not sure that I would name God specifically by identity. I think God is bigger than what we could imagine. So um, I'm not sure that I would name God in a specific way. I think, yeah. I mean, one of the gifts of scripture, there's so many varieties, right? And, and we, depending on the particular occasion, <laughs> we might have a different image or name mm-hmm. uh, or experience. And that's the, that variety is such a beautiful diversity. Uh, this week is uh, International uh, Harmony Week, mm-hmm. uh, where we're looking in Calgary and around the world at different religions and how they, uh, the differences of each. We, we're not supposed to be the same or uniform. We're supposed to celebrate our difference uh, and be one quote unquote. Mm -hmm. Uh, And and one of the speakers was saying that we're moving from plurality to anti-racist society. Mm -hmm. And and that shift is such a beautiful uh, recognition that it's not just being uh, separate and different, but really active in our Mm -hmm. Mm anti-racism, which uh, was a helpful learning for me. I'm I'm always learning. At the end of my life, I'm going to have one more question and then I'm going to die. And I encourage people through Black History Month and, and throughout the year that, that good questions invite curiosity and invite learning, just as we heard from you about that biblical text with uh, Jesus. So, mm-hmm. well, thank you. We know you're busy and you have taken time to be with us. Uh, we hope you'll come out to Hillhurst United Church uh, when we're able to physically travel and be with us. And we will follow you and your great work with United Church in the days ahead. So thank you. That's great. You're welcome. And thanks so much for the conversation and uh, blessings to all of you. Okay, thank you.